He's our sound guy. He's our drummer sometimes. He's even Bruce Springsteen sometimes. <laughs> That's our own Josh Driver. Thank you so much, Josh. I really appreciate um, all your help. We're doing a little, we're a little shorthanded this morning. And, um, but, you know, we have such amazing volunteers here. They really step up. They really support, and so I'm really grateful for each and every one. Let's give all our volunteers a big hand. And keep clapping. Let's give Kelly a big hand as well for that beautiful piece of music that she shared with us. Uh, well, welcome. My name is Reverend Alice Reed, Dr. Reverend Alice Reed. As I've been, actually, it's Reverend Dr. Alice Reed. <laughs> the honorifics and how we, um, how we pronounce them. I am really grateful to be the spiritual leader here at Centers for Spiritual Living, Capistrano Valley. It's a beautiful community full of really loving people who are dedicated to the practice and the way of life and the philosophy of um, this Centers for Spiritual Living religious science way of life. We are um, actually a philosophy that was founded by Dr. Ernest Holmes almost 100 years ago. And um, Ernest Holmes was a synthesizer. So when we talk about the principles that we share here on uh, Sunday mornings or in class or in one of your uh, uh, friendship circles or perhaps, perhaps in conscious connections or other places that we connect and talk about this philosophy, if, they, if these principles sound familiar to you, that's because they are. What we know about Dr. Holmes is that he was a synthesizer and he was a, a, a student of Eastern philosophy, Western philosophy, Christianity, Hinduism, you know, the Vedic traditions, and he brought all of that together for our philosophy. And so when we do that flames of faith on Sunday morning, that's just not to welcome individuals who may have practiced that at one time or another. It's because it's an embodiment of what we teach. That the, the real essence of all of those uh, beautiful traditions are embodied in our philosophy. It's pretty cool, huh? Yeah, yeah I agree, I agree. We um, have a wonderful annual theme each year, and this year our annual theme is Grand Rising, and so I will say Grand Rising. Yes, and that is a beautiful Caribbean term that is used by uh, fellow spiritual livers who, in, in, the, in deep south, in the, the Caribbean, who invite us to really start each day in a big way. In a big way, it's in an authentic way, when we really show up. And we have different themes each month, and this theme... Uh, this month, our theme is peace. And so we've been talking about the peace, pieces into peace. And the idea is that sometimes when we're out in the world and we're having our experience, things can feel a little disjointed or in discord. And yet we can pull the pieces of our conditions and the effects that we experience in life together to really have an experience of peace. And so, you know, five Sundays in the month of September, so we had the opportunity to really talk about peace within, that, that personal experience of peace. And then we talked about our peace in our relationships and how we find peace with each other. We talked about um, the peace in community and how we find peace in the larger community. And then last week I talked about um, peace in the world. And you'll notice in this graphic that there's little arrows in the center. So, so what, what I really tried to depict in this graphic is that that process of peace within me, peace in our relationships, peace in community, and peace in the world, is it's contiguous. It's always moving. We're always moving through different levels of peace and how we find peace. I... Um, think about this, you know, as we wrap up this idea of peace, and I think about what I see in the world, it might feel a little impossible to, or even improbable, that we can actually achieve peace in the world. We have the 
you know, the, the ongoing war in Ukraine, we have the war in the Middle East, and then we have the, you know, there's, there's conflict in various places in the world, and right here at home, we have that, uh, a real challenge around our, our party, political party system and the discord that people have um, about who's right and who's wrong and my way or the highway is the message I keep hearing. Granted, from the loudest people. But what, what I have experienced on a one-to-one -one basis is when I sit down and talk to people, regardless of whether they're party affiliation, when, when I show up as Alice and they show up with, as whoever they are, there's a place where our humanity can connect. If, if I try to see them as a human being, that's an invitation for them to see me as a human being. And, and, and we can find that, that common ground. But it's, it's, it's not easy when there are so many competing priorities in the world, right? That's what they really are, competing priorities. This one's really important to me, this one's really important to you. And so as we look for this place where we can find peace, Oftentimes, uh, we start by looking for whatever it is we're seeking outside ourselves. And I want to say that if that's how you're looking for peace, <laughs> sometimes it's really difficult to look out around you and look at the world and say, okay, I'm going to find peace here. And so when we can't find peace in the world, we can come back and look for peace in our communities. And when we can't find peace in our communities, we can come and scale it back and look at for peace in our re personal relationships. And when we can't find peace in our personal relationships, well, it, it comes back to finding peace within ourselves. And within each and every one of us, within all life, central and intrinsic to our makeup is that divine spark that is forever at peace. And so in communities like this one, we encourage people to do spiritual practice, to use the spiritual tools to find that peaceful place within ourselves. Have, have you ever met anyone who was unshakable? Right? We all have come across people from time to time. It do, and it seems like no matter what happens, they're just moving forward, they're, or they're standing still, and they, you know, they don't get upset, and they don't feel, you know, there's, there doesn't seem to be panic or drama around them when things are challenging. Yeah, that is the sign of somebody who is grounded in, from the peace within. And so that is oftentimes the place we should start. But again, we are human beings that are always relating to each other and re responding to the stimuli around us. And so sometimes we have to reel it back in to find that core place of peace within ourselves. Right. Um, you know, when I think about this idea of peace, what I know is that Peace starts with a choice. It really starts with a willingness to make a choice that you want to experience peace, that, that you want to experience peace in your relationships, in your community, in the world. And when we can make that choice, when we can really ground ourselves in a solid choice for peace, well, that's when we can begin to look around us and see how we're resourced by spirit, by that conscious choice that we make. We are a philosophy that teaches that everything is created twice, first in consciousness and then in form. And so if we as spiritual livers, if we as religious scientists make a definite and determined intention for peace, if we really embody this idea of peace, well then that's the expression we are gonna have out in the world. 
that is how we're going to relate to each other. That is how we are going, people are going to experience us because we create that intention. Now, I'm with you. There's a lot going on. And sometimes I can be a little edgy. Mm -hmm. No, maybe not. I don't know. Don't ask Mary. <laughs> um, but I have made a decision to, you know, to be a place of love. That is my intention. My intention is to respond with love. My intention is to be a place where love shows up. And peace is a natural expression of that, that choice that I've made. And so while I may lose balance from time to time, I may fall off the beam, I'm pretty quick to catch myself. And that's the benefit of taking classes and doing spiritual practice and, and being with people who are also making that choice. We can help each other remember. So when, say, I'll just say, I'll use myself, when I might be a little short with somebody, one of my fellow spiritual lovers might just look at me and say, hey, what's going on? And again, come back to that place of humanity that is so easy to forget when we're in a world of doing and getting done and accomplishing and <laughs> finding our way through stuff. I wanted to talk a little bit about what I think is one of the boldest examples of seeking peace that I have seen in my lifetime. And that is the Truth and Reconciliation Process Commission that was in South Africa when Nelson Mandela, who was imprisoned for most of his adult life, if you will, uh, many, many years. He was denied his freedom. He was denied anyone even seeing his humanity. And yet he came to a place of really wanting peace for his country. And so when he was finally released, he and Desmond Tutu came together and with the help of the other individuals who are on the same path of wanting their country to come together in peace, developed this thing called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And this commission is often described as a success model for how countries can address human rights violations and move towards peace following a lot of upheaval. If, if you know, I, I realize that as I get older and history is not known by everybody, so of course a lot of us know this, but in South Africa, there was this atrocious thing called apartheid where uh, the white South Africans were taking over the land and, and were um, actually oppressing the native uh, black South Africans. And so they had this thing called apartheid where they believed that the whites and blacks could not live together in peace. And in order to, now, now you have to recognize that it, South Africa is a huge country. Its indigenous people are black. The majority of the people who live in South Africa, the, who are native to South Africa, are, are black. And so, so we, have this, we have this situation where there was quite a bit, uh, at some point, people were saying, this is, this is not cool. And there were a lot more... Um, they were a lot more ardent about that than what I just said. But they were absolutely like, this, we can't live like this anymore. And so we had this movement towards peace, but it was hard fought. And in fighting for it, there was a lot of violence, a lot of violence in South Africa. And so when they came to this place of Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, when we came to this place, they devised this plan where victims, people who were victimized, oppressed, were um, uh, victims of violence, were invited to tell their story, and the perpetrators of that violence were, were offered amnesty if they would come forward too. And so for seven years, there were, well, let me back up a minute, there were 7,000 people who came forward for amnesty to confess their wrongdoing and to face the consequences of that 
um, with a promise for um, amnesty. So the consequences ended up being facing the darkness that they had been part of. It was a powerful time, and I remember one of the most compelling stories I heard was an older woman whose family, for the most part, was gone. They had been brutally murdered, ripped from their homes, uh, killed in, in the violence that was uh, perpetrated upon the Afrikanis in, uh, in South Africa. And so here she was, having an opportunity to tell her story, and before her was the person responsible for the deaths of her family. So the other part of the, the opportunity for the victims to tell their story was that, that Desmond Tutu was inviting them to step into forgiveness. So if you can imagine sitting before the person who's responsible for the violent deaths of your family and being asked to forgive them, or being the person who, for whatever reason, had dehumanized the acts of what he was asked to do and perpetrated such violence. If you can imagine having that situation. And, the, and so this woman comes forward and she says, I can forgive you. I think I can forgive you, but only after I get to know you. And through the whole time of telling the story of um, how she had lost her family, the man sat before her, stoic. But when she said that, when she said, I have no family, but if I can get to know you, we can be family. My humanity can know your humanity. Now, I, you know, that's one story, and it's the most compelling story that I've heard, and there were... Not everything was so grace-filled. I mean, it was a difficult time. There's still, as a matter of fact, that those Truth and Reconciliation Commission process that went on in South Africa, while it did bring the nation together, while it did bring people um, and raise and elevate their understanding of what had taken place in their country, it didn't necessarily change the poverty and the hunger that was happening in South Africa, but it did bring that country to, together so that they were no longer fractured. It did raise the awareness for the, the white population who maybe didn't know all that was going on for their white and black brothers and sisters who were facing all of this tragedy. And so I, I, what I, when I, I tell you this story because when it's time for us to reach for peace, sometimes it requires that we also reach for truth. And that truth might be something that's hurtful. The truth might be something we don't want to face. The truth might be some trauma we've had in our, in our own life. But the, but the idea of facing that truth is being able to uh, allow it to be no longer an obstacle to the greater, infinite reality of yourself. And if that old woman who had lost her whole family could find a way to come together to find some peace, well, I know we can too. I use that as an example for me, to, and it's an extreme example, I admit, but it is an example of how we can move past the consciousness of hurt and pain and denial and walk through it to find love and peace. We have a, we have a, uh, we have a new book in the bookstore. It's called Shadow Work. And yes, it's on top of your desk, Leslie. <laughs> in the bookstore, there's a couple of copies there. And, um, and this, and this shadow work is all about how not to spiritual bypass. Because it would be easy for me to live in Orange County and not watch the news and not read the paper and just pretend that everything's pretty hunky-dory in my world. But my guess is if you're experiencing some kind of lack or limitation, some challenges somewhere, there's something hiding in your shadow. 
There's something that wants to be revealed. There's some clearing that wants to happen. And in this book, uh, this is, by the way, this is by my soul sister from an, another... Mista, that's it. A soul sister from another Mista, Michelle Wadley. You've all met Dr. Michelle Wadley. She's come here a couple times. And so she quotes Robert Masters. It doesn't matter how spiritually developed we are if we remain ignorant of our shadow. Staying blind to the less than noble motivations for getting spiritual, unaware of how what's unhealthy or immature in us shows up in and often is masked by our spirituality. All too often, spirituality is a flight from the shadow, an attempt to escape what we're keeping in the dark. Such spirituality is little more than avoidance in holy robes, wherein disassociation masquerades as transcendence. Ooh. Yeah. The discord that we are seeing in the world I want to say, at some level, we hold responsibility for that collectively. We hold responsibility for that in the discord that I might hold for my neighbor. We hold responsibility for that in the, the violence that I might hold in my heart for that guy who cut me off in traffic. The idea that we can create peace in the world sounds really big and untouchable and impossible. But if I start with me, and then I move to you, and then I, I express that and, and move out into my community, it can't help but affect the world. And so, as and, you know, one of my favorite quotes from Socrates when the student asked, how do I get to Mount Olympus? And Socrates said, make sure every step is in that direction. So if your Mount Olympus is world peace, we simply need to make sure that every step is in that direction. Ernest Holmes in... Uh, talk entitled World Peace is Not an Illusion writes this. We must practice the presence of peace consciously, definitely, and deliberately. If we can do it individually and in the family and to a certain degree in our offices and businesses, which we can, why can't we do it for the whole world? Well, we can. We are indeed the ones that we're waiting for. And so in this final Sunday where we're talking about peace, the question to ask yourself is, what is yours to do? Who might you need to forgive? Who might you need to be willing to uh, let them forgive you? Where do you feel called? And how will you cultivate the courage to not spiritual bypass, but to know the truth of what is yours to, to reveal, to heal, to clear, so that you can be the clearest transparency for the divine. And so that the divine can move through you, through your consciousness, through your willingness, and be the peace that needs to show up in the world today. Thank you very much. Hey, why don't we pray as John David, as, uh, John Henry comes forward. <laughs> you know, the pianist at my last church was name was John David. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. But we have, we have John Henry, and so here we go. Hmm. So I invite you to simply go within, lower your gaze or close your eyes, and know with me this beautiful phrase that we've all heard before. Make it your own in this moment. Be still 
and know that I am God. Say that in your own mind, in your, in your, in your mind's voice, quietly to yourself. Be still and know that I am God. For there is only one, one power, one presence, one divine essence that is forever pouring itself into all of life. And so while there is one infinite reality, it knows itself as each one individuated. So indeed, each one is God. Like the wave is part of the ocean or the sun's beam is part of the sun, we are each part of God. And so we draw upon that source. We allow ourselves to be sourced with that presence to move us to the place of our intentions. And whether that intention is love or peace or beauty or joy or freedom, I know for each one that we draw upon the divine, that we allow ourselves to be those instruments of peace, to walk out from our lives into our spheres of influence to allow ourselves to be that place where God shows up as each one. And so I claim for each one the courage, the willingness to let go of, to clear, to remove all obstacles and to shine brightly in the truth, the truth of the divine as each one, as peace. It is with a grateful heart that I know this highest truth for each one. I know that we are all God in form. I know that God is forever giving of itself freely and openly. And I know for each one that we allow ourselves to be used in such a high, holy way so that we can know peace. And so I give great thanks for this. I simply let it go, knowing it is so, knowing that it is the law that carries it forward. And together we anchor this in that same power by saying together, and so it is. Thank you very much. Let's bring